So um, welcome to our Humanities Happy Hour. Um, we are, have been, this is our third virtual Montana Conversations, and we are so happy that you are here with us today with um, Christopher Preston, who will talk to us about rewilding and uh, the reintroduction of wolves in Europe. Christopher, take it away. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out, but you know, I realize actually nobody has come out <laughs> for this event. Everybody stayed in for this event, but thanks for staying in. Really <laughs> appreciate that. I am English by birth. Uh, I've been in the U.S. more than half my life, so I, I came over to the U.S. Uh, for graduate school uh, almost 30 years ago now, which is kind of mind-blowing to think about. Um, and I, I, have a, I do environmental philosophy. That's my area. I teach at the university in environmental philosophy, um, and I'm interested in this new topic of rewilding. Um, so I'm going to bring to you some of what I've learned about rewilding in the US and also in Europe, because I think there's some interesting contrasts and I feel half European and half American myself. So, uh, yeah, well, I, I do notice it's still half and not half. Yeah. So, <laughs> half. half. <laughs> you, you still have some, uh, some English, uh, yeah. It's and tomatoes and not tomatoes. Yes, very good. <laughs> it's, not, it's not potatoes, though. It's, it's potatoes. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk about wolves. So, you know, you might think, oh, good, a wildlife biology talk. Um, but uh, I'm not actually a wildlife biologist. Uh, I'm a philosopher. Um, I've, I'm a philosopher interested in wildlife biology. Um, but what that means is that as well as talking a little bit about wolves and, and what they're doing, I really want you to be thinking during this about what does it all mean? Um, you know, be philosophical and, and say, well, so there's these wolves showing up. What does that mean? What does that say about the future? That's kind of uh, the idea here. So uh, I have a set of PowerPoint slides. I'm going to talk alongside the slides. Uh, which means that I'm going to disappear into the top right of the screen and you will hopefully start seeing this wolf. Except it's not a wolf. It's a kangaroo. Um, why does a talk about wolves start with a kangaroo? Well, this is a headline I saw last Christmas day. So this was four months ago. Uh, wolf snatches pet kangaroo from Belgian home. And I have to tell you that made my Christmas day. Uh, it, was, it was just an extraordinary thing to happen. First of all, a kangaroo, um, and there aren't kangaroos in Belgium. Um, and then second of all, a wolf. Um, so the kangaroo was a pet. It was in somebody's yard. The wolf was not a pet at all. The wolf was a wild wolf that showed up in Belgium. And let me uh, see if I can just pull up my annotating tool here, uh, which it doesn't look like I can for some reason. But are, are you able to see my cursor? Yeah. OK, good. Um, so the wolf showed up in Belgium here. Um, Belgium has 11 and a half million people. Uh, it is uh, 11,000 square miles. So just to sort of give you a sense compared to Montana, we're talking about a place with roughly one twelfth of the land area and 12 times the population. So this wolf showed up in Belgium and ate that kangaroo. And look at that little sort of circle of countries there, the United Kingdom, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, France. Look at the big cities, Paris, London, Brussels, Amsterdam, Dusseldorf, Cologne. We're talking about a circle that contains a lot of population, many millions and millions of people. So what is a wolf doing there? Let's step back a little bit and think about wolves. When we think about the return of wolves and wolf reintroduction, probably if, you're, if you lived in this area for a while, your mind will go uh, straight to Yellowstone. 
and to the wolf reintroduction that took place there in 1995. And on the, on the right there, we got a picture of uh, then Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, bringing in those first wolves. It was sort of an a, um, epic kind of moment in the history of wolves in the United States. Now, where did that moment fit in wolf history in the United States? So in about the 1960s, there were almost no wolves in the US. Plenty of wolves in Canada, plenty of wolves in Alaska, but virtually no wolves in the United States. Um, except you'll see there's a little population there in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Northern Minnesota. And this was really the low point for wolves. Scroll on about half a century and quite a bit has changed. Now, if we, let's look carefully at that map. So I wanna point out a couple of things here. Um, those wolves that were on the previous map in uh, northern uh, Michigan and Minnesota, they've expanded their range a little bit. You can see some wolves, and I'm looking at the blue colors, have started to kind of creep into Montana and have crept into uh, northern Washington. But look very closely at the red spots. So we've got red spots in Idaho there, and we've got red spots in the northwest corner of Wyoming. Those are the wolf reintroductions. So you've got the wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone, uh, and you've got the wolf reintroduction in the Frank Church, uh, River of No Return Wilderness in Idaho. Go south from there, all the way down to the southern border, and you've got another tiny little red spot. Uh, those are reintroductions of Mexican gray wolves uh, in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. And then if you go way over to the east coast, into North Carolina, there's another tiny little red spot where you've got um, the red wolves reintroduced into the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. So if you look at this map, what you've got is in the blue, you've got some wolves naturally recolonizing in a couple of places. You've got wolves reintroduced in three or four places. And then from both of those populations, you've got this gradual kind of spread. So this is important because I'm going to make a distinction between wolves that are reintroduced and wolves that spread. So let's just scroll on another. This is like an imagined 50 years. So let's scroll on beyond today. And possibly uh, that spread of wolves is going to uh, increase carrying on down the Rockies uh, over towards the Cascades on the west uh, and a little bit in the northeast corner of the country too, possibly if things are allowed to go in that direction. So um, what the, the, the distinction I want us to have in mind is between wolves that are reintroduced and wolves that make their own way onto a landscape. And this is a distinction between rewilding deliberately. So when you go in with a cage and you carry a wolf in somewhere and you let it out and rewilding spontaneously. And a spontaneous rewilding is when a wolf just shows up somewhere. So nobody told it to go there. Uh, nobody brought it there. The wolf just showed up there. And it's spontaneous rewilding that I want us to focus on because if we go back to this map here, we're probably done in the United States with deliberate reintroductions of wolves, probably. I'm gonna qualify that in a second. But those uh, reintroductions that happened in Yellowstone and the Frank Church and down in the Southwest, um, they've generally been pretty successful. And what we're probably gonna be dealing with, reckoning with over the next few decades is how much spontaneous rewilding are we going to allow or how much is there going to be, how much are we going to permit, how much are we going to tolerate. So the deliberate rewilding is close to being done. I'm going to qualify that in a second. <laughs> um, but what's on the cards now is potentially a lot of this spontaneous rewilding. Now, I said, I'm gonna qualify that in a little bit. We're not completely done with deliberate rewilding and Colorado makes for a really interesting case here. So the date on this news headline, I don't know if you can see it, 
is the 25th of January, 2020. So a pack of wolves uh, was spotted for the first time uh, for many, many years in Colorado this January. Spontaneous rewilding. So those are wolves that have sort of carried on moving south from the reintroductions. There's also a ballot measure in Colorado directed towards the deliberate rewilding of wolves, which will be on the ballot this November. And if you can uh, read the text there, a yes vote on that ballot measure would deliberately rewild wolves west of the continental divide uh, by the end of 2023. So we're not completely done with um, deliberate reintroductions, but for the most part, perhaps in the United States, what we're gonna be looking at is a set of ongoing spontaneous reintroductions. Now, how are we gonna handle that? I think we can learn some interesting lessons if we go, we move from the United States to Europe. So here's another map, uh, Wolves historic range uh, and their present range. So green is the present range. And if you look at the United States on the left there, you know, we've got those wolves just kind of creeping in in the, nor in the Northern Rockies uh, and around the Great Lakes region. But we've got a lot of the US without wolves. And if you look at uh, to the center of the map, if you look at Europe, we've got uh, a huge population to the east of Europe, mainly in uh, Russia and beyond, but not so many, uh, at least until recently, not so many in Western Europe. So countries like the UK, France, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, not so many there. Um, something interesting, I, when I first saw this map, something I didn't realize and I thought was fascinating is that there's actually wolves in countries like Iraq and Saudi Arabia and the Yemen. Uh, so in those Persian Gulf states, there's wolves there and there's wolves in India and there's wolves in Pakistan and wolves in China, which I was just sort of a fascinating thing I wasn't uh, aware of before. Um, but I'm really gonna focus on the very center of that map there uh, and particularly Western Europe. So what do you think of when you think of Western Europe? Well, you think of fabulous cities like Rome or Paris uh, or Amsterdam, and you think of the sort of bucolic uh, green countryside of places like southern England. That's actually taken about uh, four miles from where I grew up and where my parents still live. Um, that's in East Sussex in England. So we think of cities and we think of sheep and we think of very gently rolling countryside, and we definitely think of cities. We think of large urban blocks of land uh, that you might suspect would be completely inhospitable to creatures like wolves. So let's focus in now on some of the countries where wolves are starting to reappear. Now, if I can, I'm gonna try again to pull up my little uh, pointer. And for some reason, I don't get my pointer, which uh, I'll just have to use my, uh, Mouse, can you see my mouse on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I could, yep. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the low point in, in wolves in the United States was round about uh, the 1950s or so. The low point in wolves in Europe was round about the end of the 19th century. So we're talking about uh, the 1880s, 1890s. By the 1880s and 1890s, wolves had basically disappeared from this central heart of Europe here. Wolves were not gone entirely from Europe. So there were wolves in the Carpathian Mountains. And if you can see my point of the Carpathians make a kind of reverse C shape through these countries here. So we're in Bosnia, we're in Romania, uh, we're up through the edge of Ukraine, a little bit into Poland there. Uh, so there was a, a, a population of wolves here in that eastern part of Europe. There's a huge population of wolves up in Russia, up here, and two small populations in the center of Italy, 
and in the northwest corner of Spain. So imagine yourself, you're, you're, in, about, you're in about 1900. Uh, you've got a few wolves in Spain, a few wolves in Italy, a few more in the Carpathians there, and a bunch up in Russia. But then pretty much nothing else in that central part of Europe. Now, when did they start coming back? They started coming back after about the 1990s. And I'm going to focus in on one particular country now, the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm choosing the Netherlands for a couple of reasons. The Netherlands is the most densely populated country in Europe. So it has over a thousand people per square mile compared to Montana's having about seven people per square mile. Uh, 16,000 square miles in land area. 17% of that land area would not be land, it would be sea if the Dutch weren't so good at building dikes and blocking water from flooding places. Uh, sorry, yeah, 17% would be the sea. Uh, and an additional 33%, if those dikes didn't function well, uh, would end up being uh, below sea level. And importantly, zero wilderness. So the Netherlands has 0% of its land mass as wilderness. So one of the reasons I want us to start with the Netherlands uh, is that it's an incredibly densely populated country. It's right next to Belgium. So that kangaroo um, event that happened is going to connect to our story about the Netherlands in a little bit here. But the, the main reason it is such a densely populated country. There's a second reason why I want us to talk about the Netherlands. The Netherlands is the heart of the European rewilding movement. And this organization called Rewilding Europe is based in this town called Nijmegen, which is in on the um, eastern side of the Netherlands there. It's actually very close to the German border. And uh, Rewilding Europe is run by this guy in the bottom right, Wouter Helmer, who has this vision about allowing landscapes to go back over to natural processes and back over to wildlife. Now, in the Netherlands, when you rewild, a lot of what you do is you let floods uh, take place. So you take down dikes, uh, you let those low-lying areas flood again, and you let those natural hydrological regimes uh, reassert themselves on the landscape. So when I actually sat down for coffee with Wouter Helmer, and I said, let's talk about rewilding. Let's talk about all the animals you're, you're going to bring back. And he said, Christopher, Christopher, I'm Dutch. Uh, the Dutch don't think about rewilding primarily in terms of animals. We think about rewilding in terms of natural processes, floods, hydrology, erosion. Uh, we think of the water table. We think of the dikes. Uh, so this is one aspect of rewilding in the Netherlands, is allowing these water regimes uh, to come back and reassert themselves. But another aspect of rewilding in the Netherlands is to reintroduce species. So this is an area called the Oostvaardersplassen, which is quite close to Amsterdam, where as well as, well as letting the water um, resume its original kind of flooding type of regime, uh, the Dutch have reintroduced a number of species, uh, conic ponies, heck, cattle, some red deer, uh, and they've created what they call new nature, um, which is, it's a funny notion that it's sort of a, an oxymoron. Uh, you know, you think, well, nature is what was here originally, right? Nature is what preceded humans. But when the Dutch are rewilding, uh, they're saying we're creating new nature, we're creating another version of nature. Mm -hmm. And notice this is deliberate rewilding. The Dutch are saying, let's take down that dike, Let's put the animals in. Uh, let's build up this new type of nature. So the Dutch were very happy doing that for about uh, two decades. And then suddenly, something bizarre happened. A wolf showed up. A wolf showed up dead on the side of the road in a province called Flevoland. Uh, and Amsterdam is, you see the little red uh, province of Flavorland. Amsterdam is just to the bottom left of that. 
So we're talking basically about uh, a wolf showing up right outside of Amsterdam. On the side of the road, dead. Uh, it appeared to have been hit by a car. Um, the Dutch biologists were astonished. Um, they thought, how can there be a wolf in the middle of the most densely populated country uh, in Europe? They had heard of wolves returning to Germany. So Germany is just off to the east there of the Netherlands. And so they sort of suspected that it was possible, maybe, but not for a number more years. So they took a close look at this wolf. Uh, and I met the guy who actually did the autopsy on it. Uh, he's called Hauch Jansman, uh, and he's at Wageningen University. Uh, and he uh, does the, the necropsy uh, and tries to find the cause of death of animals that die in suspicious circumstances in the Netherlands. So Hauk said, when I chatted to him, one of the things he bragged about is he said, uh, you know what, Christopher, I probably had more dead wolves in the back of my car than any other Dutchman alive. <laughs> but that's his car, right? You think, amazing. Now, when, I, when he says more dead wolves, he probably means about three or four because wolves have only just started coming back to the Netherlands. Uh, but when they do come back, he's the person that deals with them. Now, this wolf on the side of the road just outside Amsterdam turned out when they cut the wolf open and looked in its stomach, it had a beaver in the stomach. And they looked at the tissues of the beaver and they looked at the uh, carbon isotopes in the tissues. And it turned out that the beaver was from way far east, uh, somewhere like Belarus or Eastern Poland or uh, Russia. It just, it didn't have the carbon isotopes in it that a beaver from the Netherlands uh, would have. So they thought, well, there's something kind of fishy going on here. Um, so they continued investigating and it turned out that the wolf had uh, been shot in Poland and then brought into the Netherlands as a hoax. So I, I don't know what the Dutch find funny, but obviously somebody thought it'd be funny to bring a wolf in and scare the Dutch uh, with the idea that there were wolves outside Amsterdam. But even though this turned out initially to be a hoax, and this was in 2013, um, wolves were in fact on their way to the Netherlands. And it wasn't long after that, uh, that how started to get genuine reports uh, of wolves showing up. They were showing up on wildlife cameras, uh, farmers were seeing them, uh, and wolves were starting to come into the Netherlands from the east. So that's, a, again, another picture of the Netherlands. Everything to the right of that picture is Germany. Uh, and these wolves were heading, they'd headed across Germany into the Netherlands, and they started showing up in these provinces like Groningen, Drenthe, uh, Gelderland, uh, and Dutch people started seeing them there. Now, uh, Sam is going to help me out here for a second. I've got a couple of little videos that I was uh, wanting to show of wolves uh, showing up in the Netherlands. Now, they're very brief. They're, there's three videos. They're each about 30 seconds long. Um, and it gives you an idea of what the landscape is that these wolves are showing up on. So there's a wolf running along the edge of a farmer's field, uh, sort of typical rural Dutch countryside. Um, there's a couple more. Oops. Here's a wolf on the side of the road, and we're uh, in near Meppen. You can see it's not quite sure what, what to do next, but it's making its way down the road. And then this third one, I think is the most remarkable. There's a wolf in Groningen. Okay, then we don't for Berlin, huh? Oh, 
Now, I don't speak Dutch, but I'm pretty sure she said, holy moly, that's a wolf. Um, I mean, it, it was a wolf, like literally going down the, going down the middle of the street there. So these wolves, these wolves suddenly start showing up. Um, now, those three videos were uh, particularly um, sort of striking because they were in, in very urban places. Um, the wolves that are making their homes in the Netherlands uh, are choosing the less urban places. So this uh, is a forest, a protected area called the Velua in the central Netherlands. And last summer, the first uh, wolf pack denned uh, and bred uh, in the Velua. And there were three pups uh, born, and those pups are still living in the Netherlands. So those wolves have settled now in the Netherlands. Um, there's resident wolves, there's breeding wolves, uh, and it's the first time in over a century that they've been there. Now, I want us to um, connect back up with our uh, friends in Belgium, the kangaroos uh, and the wolves in Belgium. So let's just look again at this map. Um, we've got wolves coming across Germany, so coming from the east, uh, Russia, Poland, into Germany, into the Netherlands, and then dropping south into Belgium. And uh, Hugh Jansman, the uh, pathologist who uh, figured out that that beaver in, in that first wolf's stomach was not from the, ne not from the Netherlands, um, he tracked a particular wolf. And if you look at that map, um, that wolf comes from Germany, goes into the Netherlands, heads south through the Netherlands, pops back into Germany, pops back into the Netherlands, and ends up uh, down in Belgium. So the wolf shows up in Belgium, and here is the headline, uh, 2018, first recorded wolf on Belgian soil for at least 100 years. Uh, and the wolf took down uh, a couple of sheep. Um, initially, it was just a solitary wolf, and they named it Naya. Um, but that solitary wolf eventually found a mate, uh, and nobody knew if Naya successfully bred with that mate. Um, they saw the mate, and they named the mate August. Um, so Naya and August were hanging out. Uh, there was some hope and, and uh, optimism that they were starting to breed and starting to raise pups. And then tragically, Naya was killed, basically shot uh, by a hunter. There, there's some pretty um, devoted hunters in Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Uh, even though you know, there's not vast amounts of wildlife, uh, the hunting culture is still pretty strong. And Naya was killed uh, by a hunter in Belgium. Um, and this was not too long before that headline about uh, the kangaroo being taken. So the kangaroo, it's, it's highly suspected um, that the kangaroo was taken by August. So August is the, the um, mate of Naya. Um, and you can imagine August being sort of pretty pissed off about the situation. Uh, so he goes out and he takes down a kangaroo from someone's backyard, um, which was a, a bit of sort of sweet revenge or something like that, I guess. Um, so let's, uh, let's focus on a few more of these countries in Europe. So the picture we've got so far is we've got wolves spontaneously appearing, first in Germany, then in the Netherlands, then in Belgium. Let's head a little bit south and, uh, well, actually, let's, let's not head there just yet. Let's look at, look at the map again briefly. So on the left, we've got that map I, I showed before. Uh, on the right, we've got a wildlife biologist studying uh, the wolves and starting to track their spontaneous resurgence through Europe. And it's important to emphasize that this is all spontaneous rewilding. 
So there is not a single country in Europe where wolves have been deliberately reintroduced. So what we did here in uh, Yellowstone, uh, in Arizona, in North Carolina, that has happened nowhere in Europe. All the wolves that have shown up in Europe have spontaneously found their way back. And if we, uh, my, I don't know where, where my mouse has gone to, um, but if we look at these populations that I described before, um, we've got that population in Northwest Spain. So over on the left uh, hand side of the map, the Iberian Peninsula, we've got that population that's uh, growing a little bit uh, and pushing out uh, from um, those mountainous regions where it lives. Let's go east from Spain, let's go to Italy. And you can see we've got wolves growing up and down the center of Italy, that's the Apennine chain. And then going all the way to the north of Italy, through the Alps, and spilling out to the west into France. So you've got wolves all over southern France, and then in France, those wolves are moving north. So wolves now really in central France. Then let's go east from Italy into the, what they call a the Dinaric region, those uh, Balkan states and the Carpathians. So that's that big sea, sort of backward sea uh, that goes through Romania, through Ukraine, into Poland. And you've got wolves spilling out at the top of that sea uh, through Poland, spilling out in towards Germany. Uh, and then up to the top right, you've got those Russian wolves, which are uh, spilling also south into Poland and north and west into Finland. And from Finland, uh, spilling over into Sweden and Norway. So you've got these wolves all moving from the south and east and north of Europe, all moving west uh, across the continent and gradually repopulating all these different parts of Europe. Now, I started with the Netherlands because the Netherlands is strikingly densely populated. But let's go to another country that's got a fair amount of people, Italy. 60 million people in Italy. So we've got 60 times the human population that Montana has. Uh, and we've got a land area about uh, four fifths of the Montana land area. So we've got 60, 60 times the human population uh, and only about 80% of the land area. And yet we've got 2,000 wolves in Italy. So we don't have 2,000 wolves in Montana. Um, there might be 2,000 wolves in the Northern Rocky region, uh, but Italy is doing substantially better than Montana is for wolf numbers. Now, I wanna give you a sense of the landscape uh, and some of the people uh, dealing with wolves. Um, so this fellow is a truffle hunter. Um, that's a truffle hunting dog he's got there. And that dog runs around sniffing out truffles. Um, this man is furious at wolves. Uh, he's got plenty of friends who are shepherds. Uh, he's got friends who are hunters who like to hunt the wild boar or the chingali as they call them. And he says the shepherds can't uh, make a living anymore. Uh, the wild boar are getting decimated by wolves. Uh, and I, I asked him through a translator, I said, how many wolves are there in Umbria? So we're talking about one province in Italy. And he said, I think there's 2,000 wolves in Umbria. Now, the official number is 2,000 in the whole of Italy, uh, but 2,000 in Umbria is probably an overestimate. Uh, but we're talking about a place that is thick with wolves. And that's the landscape we're talking about. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of forest for sure, but there's olive groves, there's vineyards, uh, there's all kinds of cereal crops, uh, there's small market gardens. Um, we're talking about a very much inhabited landscape, which is playing host to these enormous numbers of wolves. Italy has, as well as 60 million people, they've done a pretty good job at preserving parks. So there's sort of a string of parks up through the country there. 
and the wolves are hopscotching between the parks and into the agricultural lands. And a couple of years ago, wolves showed, out, showed up in this park just outside of Rome, about 25 miles away from the city center. So think about that, wolves 25 miles from Rome in a country of 60 million people. So let's look back at this map again. We've got those Italian wolves repopulating dramatically and heading north and out into France. Uh, we've got those Carpathian wolves going through Poland and Germany into, uh, into the Netherlands, into Belgium. And then up north, we've got uh, wolves. Wolves were possibly never eradicated from Finland, but they were brought down to very low numbers. But now they've resurged in Finland uh, and also in uh, Norway and Sweden to the west of Finland there. And those three countries also have a pretty strong hunting tradition and a pretty strong agricultural tradition. Uh, and so there's lots of stories about how uh, problematic wolves are uh, on the landscape in Finland. There's a story from Finland. Um, the Norwegians every year, they want to uh, hunt uh, more wolves than, than the wolf population can really take. Um, the Norwegians have a, a very invested in their farmers. Um, they, uh, it, it's sort of a, it's a mixed blessing. They're, they're very committed to uh, farmers. The, the small farm is protected in a way in Norway that it is not in the United States. But the, the flip side of that very generous policy towards farmers is when it comes to wildlife, um, if the farmers aren't happy with a certain uh, form of wildlife, then the government will uh, do their best to accommodate the farmers. So the Norwegians keep their wolf population below 100, which seems remarkably small for a country uh, as thinly populated as Norway. But still, those wolves uh, constantly resupplied from the east and from Russia, still these wolves keep pouring uh, across through Finland uh, and into Scandinavia. So, there's the wolves in Italy uh, making their way into France. There's the wolves making their way through Germany. There's the wolves uh, in Scandinavia. The wolves are back in Switzerland. Uh, there's wolves, more wolves in France than the farmers want to see. Um, they set a goal. Interesting thing about this headline is they set a goal of 500 wolves by 2023. Uh, and they've already reached that goal. So here we are in 2020. Uh, and there's in excess of 500 wolves in France already. So sort of summing up a little bit these numbers, you've got wolf populations that are either stable or increasing in most of Europe. And there's not a single country in continental Europe that doesn't have wolves now back on its landscape. And that's why we started with Belgium and the kangaroo story, because Belgium was the last country in continental Europe uh, to see wolves return, but the wolves have now returned there. Um, of course, the odd person out in all of this is the UK, um, and I'm sort of rather embarrassed to say that, being a UK uh, citizen originally. There's talks about deliberately reintroducing wolves in the UK. The channel is wide enough that those wolves couldn't swim across the channel. One of my students said, well, can they stow away on a boat? Uh, I mean, I like the idea, but uh, it, would, it would be pretty alarming if you were on one of those ferries and, and you suddenly walked around a corner and there was a wolf. Um, so in the UK, it's going to require some sort of deliberate rewilding, deliberate reintroduction. But across the rest of Europe, wolves have spontaneously returned to every single country, which is just a remarkable thing. Um, and it's especially remarkable when you look at these sort of macro statistics, half the land area, double the human population. So you've got over 600 million people in Europe. Um, and you've got twice the number of wolves as in the United States. It's just, it's a remarkable wildlife story. The rewilding that has happened is absolutely remarkable. So let me put my philosopher hat on and we're into the last five or eight minutes or so here. I want to put my philosopher hat on and I want to ask why, how could this happen? What does it mean? What, 
Is there more tolerance for wolves in Europe? Or what's going on that allows this dramatic kind of resurgence? And you know, maybe we can we can sort of pinpoint three or four factors that have contributed to this success. Um, and the first one is a combination of demographic changes and economic changes. Now, that map on the right, the only thing you need to pay attention to is how much green there is. Because the green is not forest. The green is formerly agricultural land uh, or forestry land that is reverting back to nature. So it's formerly managed land that is now on its own rewilding because it doesn't have any use anymore. And this is a, a combination of demographics and economics. Um, it's demographics because fertility rates in Europe uh, in most countries are at or below replacement level. So populations are not growing in Europe. Uh, they tend to be in several of the countries decreasing or you know, maybe somewhat stable with a combination of uh, uh, domestic fertility rates and immigration, but populations are not exploding. That's the demographic piece. Um, the economic piece is uh, European Union agricultural policy, uh, which has centralized uh, the agriculture in the most productive areas. So marginal lands that perhaps half a century ago were being cultivated uh, thanks to EU policies are no longer being cultivated uh, and are reverting back to nature. And this has helped creatures like wolves return. So one of those factors is simply demographics and economics, just a sort of a, a, a shifting of, of uh, where the people are and what they're doing. A second factor I think is the types of protections that are provided for wildlife and for landscape. So if you are part of the EU, if you're a member state, you have to obey the Habitats Directive. Um, and the Habitats Directive is there to promote biodiversity. And as part of that Habitats Directive, uh, you have to participate in what they call Natura 2000, which is a piecing together of protected areas to provide connectivity, uh, to provide a network that animals can use uh, to rebuild their populations. And those two EU laws have been very effective as far as permitting certain species to return. A third factor I wanna uh, draw our attention to here is, is an interesting one. It's a political history factor. So as you know, uh, Europe was split down the middle uh, by the Cold War and the Iron Curtain divided those countries that were essentially uh, loyal to or uh, sort of under enforced occupation by the Soviets uh, and those that were not and were part of NATO. There was a whole lot of military bases uh, along that divide. Uh, and what those military bases did is they effectively kept people out of the forests and out of those areas along that Iron Curtain. Now, at the same time, so that was one uh, sort of facet of political history, this militarization around the Iron Curtain. Another facet of it is that the countries to the east that were part of uh, uh, the Soviet bloc tended to be run by dictators who, many of them loved the idea of having their own hunting preserves. Um, so people like Ceausescu in Romania uh, essentially uh, kept people out of the forest so that he could go hunting uh, the, the deer, uh, the bears, uh, and what wolves there were. Um, and of course, so this was obviously socially horrible, um, but for wildlife, it actually turned out to be beneficial because there was only uh, a few of the few people hunting them, who were these dictators and their cronies, um, and everybody else was kept out of those landscapes. So the Cold War, strangely, uh, turned out to be very good for animals like wolves. And when the Iron Curtain came down, uh, 
um, those military bases in, especially in Germany, uh, many of which became unoccupied or at least became much more lightly occupied uh, after the tensions dissipated, those military bases became uh, breeding grounds for recolonizing wolves. And in Germany, there have been studies that showed that um, the early recolonizing wolves were more likely to breed on military bases initially than they were in nature reserves, which is sort of an extraordinary fact, but it's a product of the fact that nature reserves attracted a lot of people with binoculars and people poking around and trying to see what's going on at all hours of the day, whereas military bases didn't. You know, obviously you had to deal with the odd tank, uh, but you didn't have to deal with thousands of tourists with binoculars eating sandwiches and uh, traipsing around all parts of the landscape. So this political history was a factor. There's a, also an interesting sort of advocacy that takes place in Europe, which I think is, is worth noting. So imagine if you live in a very densely populated country and creatures like wolves or maybe bears start returning. Um, to you, that's just remarkable because, you know, they haven't been there for a century or more. Um, and what happened in countries like the Netherlands and in Germany is people showed up and said, I'm excited about these animals coming back. What can I do to help? And the answer was what you could do to help was you could help the farmers. And so this particular organization called WikiWolves uh, formed. And what it was, was a collection of people who would give their weekends to go help farmers put up electric fences to protect their sheep from these returning wolves. Um, so this was free labor done by people who really wanted to see wolves come back. And so it obviously had this very sort of practical benefit for the farmers. The uh, various national governments tended to fund these uh, preventative measures to 80 or sometimes 100% of the costs. So the farmers ended up getting free fencing or very nearly free fencing, uh, free labor. And also it was sort of pointed out to me when I, when I was asking uh, some of the people involved in this, uh, why it was so successful. What it also did is it got people interested in wolves talking to people who would have to live with wolves. And so you got people on each side of the debate spending weekends with each other um, the farmers would pre prepare meals for the workers and, and the workers would do their labor and then sit down with the farmer and the farmer's family and eat meals. And it was a way of bringing together the two sides of this debate, the wolf advocates and those who were somewhat hesitant about the arrival of uh, the return of wolves. And it, it created a different pathway towards wolf reintroduction, uh, perhaps to what we're uh, familiar with here. So I'm an environmental philosopher. I have a couple of environmental philosophy friends in Europe, and this is one of them, Martin Drenthen. And Martin was actually out in Montana two years ago. He, he spent five months here as part of his sabbatical, and he spent a lot of time in Yellowstone uh, watching wolves there and, and just talking to people about wolves. And he and I have chatted a little bit about um, what you need to bring wolves back in a place like um, the Netherlands. And he says, well, there's, there's two components here. Um, the advocates, the people who are in favor of it, need to understand why uh, the farmers are so hesitant and need to understand what it is like to live with a type of economic insecurity uh, that a farmer afraid for her or his sheep uh, lives with. So the wildlife advocates need to understand that. But here's the flip side, which I thought was very interesting. And I thought it was you know, perhaps a characteristically European response to this. Uh, Professor Drenthon says, the farmers also need to understand that the city dwellers have a real need for those wolves. Um, it's important for them to know that those wolves are there, to feel that their country is welcoming them back. And this is not a, uh, Martin said, it's not a, a sort of superficial uh, type of need. This is an essential uh, thing for many urbanites in the Netherlands. Uh, and so that communication between 
um, those who live in a rural economy uh, and those who live urban lives, uh, that communication is essential for both sides to understand the different sorts of needs that are at work. And this was the line that really struck home for me. It gets awfully lonely, says the philosopher, if you only see people and no other organisms. So pulling this all together, there's a number of things I think we can uh, learn or, or think about. So as Americans now, where we're faced now with the spontaneous rewilding, the spread of these animals like wolves beyond where they first trickled back into the country or beyond where they first got reintroduced, um, there's things that uh, perhaps we on this continent can learn uh, from Europe. Um, one of them, uh, I think one of the most striking ones, is that wolves are very opportunistic and adaptable. Uh, and though I'm sure they prefer to live in big wildernesses, they don't only live in big wildernesses. And some of those videos from the Netherlands, I think, make that clear. If you give them the chance, they'll come back. If you have the laws in place, the animals will do, this, do the work. Um, and this is what has just been astonishing about wolf recovery in Europe. Um, the animals did the work themselves. Um, and then there's this social dynamic that has to be negotiated. And you're familiar, I'm sure, with the debate here. Um, and it kind of goes like this, like the stereotype of it goes like this. Well, the people who want wolves live in the cities and they don't understand uh, the needs of people who live in the country. And it, in the Netherlands and in Germany, they, they've sort of said, well, there might be some truth to the fact that the people who want wolves live in the cities, but that doesn't end the discussion. Uh, the discussion then has a few more layers to it. Uh, so there's an interesting sort of social experiment here in terms of how urban and rural people can communicate over things like wolves. And then finally, um, there's a, a, a lesson where ecology uh, meets sociology, um, there is an ecological carrying capacity of wolves. You know, how many wolves a particular landscape can carry and have those, uh, have there be enough food and so forth for the wolves. But that number is probably going to be different from what the cultural carrying capacity is. How many wolves a particular society can accept on their landscape. And the question is how close can that ecological carrying capacity come to that cultural carrying capacity? Those numbers are gonna start pretty far away. On a landscape where there are no wolves, those numbers are gonna start a long way away. So the question is how close can you bring those numbers together? And I think that's uh, something that is gonna evolve over the next couple of decades. So those are my lessons from Europe. Uh, I hope they uh, made you think about some things and, and about what the future might hold. And uh, I'm done, so I don't know if you wanna ask anything, I'd be happy to do my best to answer it. Are there other species that are rewilding spontaneously in Europe at the same time with the wolves? Good question. There are 17,000 brown bears in Europe. Um, and brown bears are showing up in countries where they haven't been for many years. Uh, so there was a, a brown bear in Germany about a decade or so ago that they called Bruno. Uh, and Bruno ended up getting killed. Uh, but um, a brown bear just showed up in Germany in the last three months again. Um, there's brown bears in Italy. Uh, there's brown bears an hour and a half from Rome. Uh, there are wolverine across northern Europe. There are lynx returning to many different areas of Europe. So yeah, it's not just wolves. Um, there, because of those demographic and economic changes, uh, a lot of species are starting to return. Uh, and the political environment is one that generally uh, is welcoming to those animals. At least the legal framework welcomes those animals. Have they had, um, like, have uh, have there been negative impacts of having those large predators on 
on humans? Like, have people been attacked or? Have no, 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 people, of- no people have been attacked. Um, there, there are sheep getting eaten, for sure. Uh, and, you know, in, in France and in Germany, particularly, um, there's, the farmers are unhappy about it. Um, but that there's a lot of uh, preventative measures that can be um, pretty effective if you get on it early. Um, and those, you know, they have a pretty sophisticated um, electric fencing system that they use in Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, and that there's actually plenty of prey. So creatures like wild boar and deer are um, all over the place. Um, the Netherlands actually, so that, that biologist Jansman, do you remember the guy with the little car? <laughs> um, he told me that um, so I think it's 70% of the deer in the Netherlands have to be culled every year by hunters to prevent crop damage and overgrazing. So there are many deer, many more deer in the Netherlands than the Netherlands can handle. So if you are a wolf coming back to the Netherlands, there's plenty of prey. So if you can do things in such a way, if you can manage wolves and manage their habits adequately, you know, don't let them get a taste for sheep in the first place. If you can do that, then there's plenty of prey base and those wolves could live off the prey base. Um, so th- there is conflict, there are losses. Um, to date, there's been no human interactions or human injuries uh, that I have heard of. I've been sort of following this for three or four years. Um, so not a, not a human problem, but, but an economic issue for farmers uh, somewhat, and, and certainly sort of a perception issue as well. What about an impact on the, um, like the, the urban psyche that you were talking about, like the urban people have these needs to know that that wilderness is there. Has, is, has there been an effect seen on that? I'm not, I'm not sure if that's sort of been quantified and studied in a way. Um, the, the one thing that Martin, told me that the philosopher in the Netherlands, um, he, he didn't, so when the, when the wolf showed up, do you remember that video of the wolf running down the street? Yeah. Um, so the tabloid papers said, um, video of bloodthirsty killer uh, running past children in their gardens looking for its next meal. That's what, there was literally a tabloid headline is a bloodthirsty killer looking for its next meal. And Martin said, you know, if you asked people in the Netherlands, were they terrified of this wolf? The vast majority weren't terrified at all. They thought it was fantastic. Uh, They thought it was very exciting. Um, And so there is a lot of enthusiasm for these animals and knowing that those animals are there. And those volunteer organizations, the Wiki Wolves organizations, um, they have tons of people wanting to go out on the weekends to help with, with the work and to help the farmers. Um, so there is a lot of enthusiasm uh, for the return of the wild in some of these countries. And, and the UK, so I mentioned a little bit the UK, um, the UK is very keen on this rewilding movement, and some of the leading rewilders are, are in the UK. Um, they want the rewilders in the UK want to get a lot of the sheep off of the highlands because uh, if, you, if you sort of picture uh, rural UK, the Lake District, uh, the the moors, um, parts of North Yorkshire, in your mind, in the picture, will be sheep. Sheep, 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 sheep. And this is what British people have kind of become accustomed to, but it's not necessarily what the landscape uh, should be. Um, and one of the interesting, so there's an interesting uh, overlap of interests happening around sheep and the highlands. So the UK is suffering a lot from uh, increased rainfall because of climate change. So uh, 
growing up in the UK, let me tell you, it rains a lot there. <laughs> and um, the warmer it gets, most of the weather systems come from the west off the Atlantic. So the warmer it gets, as those weather systems come into the UK, they are going to hold more and more water because, uh, you know, a warmer climate puts more water into the air. Um, which means that the UK is getting more and more flood events. Now, one way to mitigate a flood event is to get the water trapped up in the highlands before it kind of washes down into the valleys and down the rivers. And if you remove sheep off the highlands and you let those landscapes revegetate, uh, let the forest regrow, then that serves to hold the water up there in those highlands and it de decreases flooding down in the valleys and in the lowlands. So there's this strange kind of coincidence where rewilding is mapping onto climate change mitigation. Get the sheep off, get the trees back on. And also, so another rewilding strategy here is get beavers on the landscape. And that's happening in the UK too. So get the sheep off, get the trees on, get the beavers in there. Uh, and that should help with some of the flooding in the UK. So there's, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this. It's really, for me, it's been really interesting because you know I, I left the UK feeling like it was a very managed landscape without much wildlife. And now I go back there and um, there's this real movement to take your hands off and let the animals back on and see what benefits you can get from it. So it's really, it's really fascinating. It's amazing. Well, we're, we're a little bit after five. Um, if anyone else has any questions, we can go a little bit longer or we can say thank you to Christopher. Um, I feel like I've learned so much and like had no idea the numbers of wolves in Europe. Like I, I thought that we, in you know in the in montana would definitely have more wolves than than in paris <laughs> it's striking it really is striking all right well thank you guys um we'll have another virtual program next week um ed kimmick is going to be talking about online journalism um and we'll have another happy hour at friday at four um thank you so much for joining us for this one thanks everybody appreciate you coming